Central Tibetan Administration's think tank, Tibet Policy Institute, has compiled articles on various topics related to COVID-19. The book that was recently launched discusses China's role in dealing with COVID and its effects on Tibet and the world. Today, joining me, I have two research fellows of Tibet Policy Institute, Tenzing Ladu and Tenzing Wangda. Ladu La and Wangda La, welcome to our show. Thank you. Tibet Policy Institute have very nicely brought all the COVID-related topics concerning the effects that has caused um, around the world, including the Tibetans. Ladun in your article, you have mentioned about China's increasing assertive in its position on the international stage. What has been its primary objective behind its actions during uh, the pandemic? We get the idea that there is a fundamental transition in the Chinese diplomacy from a low key, conservative low key to a more assertive mm -hmm. and uh, proactive. In fact, uh, Xi Jinping's ascension to power revealed that China has become more um, um, uh, assertive uh, in um, uh, putting forward its uh, pet project, which is called uh, Belt and Road Initiative, how China's presence in South China Sea and East China Sea has created uh, issues around the world. And recently, uh, we have seen with how Beijing has dealt with the pro-democracy pro protest in Hong Kong and thereafter uh, how uh, China has forcefully implemented the national security law. So we see that there is a fundamental shift in the Chinese uh, foreign um, uh, policy from Teng Xiaoping's keeping a low profile to Xi Jinping's displaying global ambition by asserting its core interests. And when we are talking about uh, China's assert, uh, assertiveness, uh, uh, it is reflected not only in uh, 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 domestic policy, but more so in handling uh, issues abroad, especially in the international fora. As I have written in my article in this volume, I've mentioned how China has manipulated international organizations like uh, WHO, World Health Organization, in excluding uh, Taiwan from participating in the World Health Assembly and also rejecting Taiwan's bid in considering Taiwan as an observer state. Um, despite Taiwan's impressive containment of the pandemic within its borders. So what we see is that, there, 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 that Xi Jinping uh, himself has propagated uh, this assertiveness in dealing with foreign uh, dignitaries and uh, uh, foreign counterparts. And we see that proactive uh, stand being taken by various uh, uh, Chinese diplomats, especially we see some of them going into social media and hitting back against the criticism uh, that is received on China's handling of the COVID-19. Taking all these into consideration, uh, we can ask, or uh, uh, we can, uh, uh, I think it is apt to ask whether um, Beijing's approach to uh, uh, global uh, political and economic and cultural matter is the new normal in the international relations, uh, or should China's aggressive expansion and diplomatic muscles be checked at all level? So uh, Wang Dala, in your article, you have mentioned about the growing surveillance, especially during this COVID-19 phase. Can you tell us briefly on the primary objective of uh, Chinese Communist Party's surveillance system upgrade in China, Tibet and Xinjiang? So when you look at surveillance as such, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to China and CCP, it's not something new for them. They've been doing it for a very, very long time. And, and all in China, other parts of the country, kings, emperors in the past, mm -hmm. and even Mao's time, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, today is different. Today, you're throwing a big data. Mm -hmm. We, all of us, are online. We, we, our preferences, what we think, what we want to do, uh, everything online. It's mm -hmm. all, all digitized, right? Yeah. So now, governments today have uh, access to a data that was wasn't there in the past at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it comes to private companies, for example, recently we know about the recent issues of what say privacy with Google, Facebook, you know, mm -hmm. and how they use this data mm -hmm. and then they feed us quote unquote mm -hmm. advertisements yeah. to sort of modify our behavior. But now what China has done today is very interesting. They have taken this ability of private companies, but they're using it for their own state benefit. Mm -hmm. So to basically control and modify uh, people's behavior in, in China, East Turkestan, uh, Tibet, and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, and so the main objective seems to be that, is to not just sort of, I would say, react to events. So for example, we had Tiananmen Square in the past, right? And then when the Tiananmen Square protests happened, then China sent their tanks. But now the objective seems to be to predict, first of all, mm -hmm. and then to prevent these protests, first. Mm -hmm. The second is to, I think, is to 
uh, modify uh, people's opinion about mm -hmm. the country. For example, when you had the security law of Hong Kong mm -hmm. recently mm -hmm. passed, mm -hmm. and you saw in mainland China, you had this, uh, this, this state-sponsored media outlets putting out so much propaganda, and then that was just to change people's opinion of make it uh, in, in more in favor of the security law. I think that's what uh, Xi Jinping also in 2012, uh, when he became in power, his main, one of the main objective was what he called internet sovereignty. Right, mm -hmm. so that collection mm -hmm. of huge data was a very important thing because he, because he and the party realized that's a huge tool for the state to use. Right, mm -hmm. so now we look at, for example, China itself in terms of what it has done in terms of uh, uh, what you call it, a digitization of the economy. Right, so China uh, has about 860 million internet users. It was it was the world largest. 2018, uh, I think almost half of the world global e-commerce transaction is from China. So it's a huge market, right? Mm -hmm. And then even in terms of surveillance, you have the Great Firewall. So I think Counter Power Lab, it's a group in Berkeley, used to be Berkeley, they have uh, reported that in 2018, the firewall actually stopped almost 1,382 websites. Mm -hmm. China has, I think, 800 uh, 314 million receive cameras to 18, and this number is go going to go up to about 500 million mm -hmm. in 2021. So it is the world's most surveilled state. Mm -hmm. And now the amount of data you generate mm -hmm. that comes into play because, for example, you have the the uh, social credit systems could come out this year, mm -hmm. and this is going to basically tell people that certain behaviors are going to be uh, rewarded mm -hmm. and certain are going to be punished mm -hmm. based on the data they collect. So the government is now literally going to know exactly what you think. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate objective. And more importantly, and before you uh, want to go to street protest, and then they say, thanks, no. You, you literally be, even before you think of protesting, you're like, no, I, I don't want to protest. You know? So that's mm -hmm. a preventive, a more offensive action on China's part. So I think that's mm -hmm. one of the, so it's not only about knowing what you're doing, which mm -hmm. we always think surveillance, but it's, it's got a more proactive engagement altogether, mm -hmm. a larger goal plan. So I think mm -hmm. that is what China objective is when it comes to its uh, mm -hmm. s system surveillance, whether it be being in China, Hong Kong, mm -hmm. uh, Western countries, including the European Union, have demanded investigation into the origin of uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus. Then came the accusations from the Chinese experts and researchers claiming that the virus had actually originated from Europe. So these tensions over the origin of the pandemic did bring some change in China's relation with the European Union and also the U.S. So, um, Latula, can you tell us something about this? So uh, prior to the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there's a sh uh, uh, China EU relation took a shift uh, when uh, European Commission came up with a joint communication in early 2019, right before the outbreak of the COVID-19. And that joint communication has been the most critical that EU has come forward in terms of labeling China. So this, for the first time, has labeled China as a systemic rival, promoting alternative models of governance. So this week, can relate it to uh, Beijing's growing presence in the international fora, uh, growing political influence and uh, global ambition to lead. Th and these all together has caused a rift between China and EU. The relationship uh, continue to uh, suffer even after the outbreak of the COVID-19 and has exposed uh, some of the fundamental differences between China and EU. For instance, recently EU's uh, foreign affairs chief Joseph Borrell, in a number of occasions, he has critically labeled China as involving in politicization and publicity of the COVID-19. So he kind of derived that idea because Beijing took the outbreak of the COVID-19 as an opportunity to take forward its pet project, which is Belt and Road Initiative. It's a larger project, but under which we see that in Europe, it has been implemented in a way that it has been named as 17 plus. 17 is the uh, 17 different European countries and one is China. Through this project, China could be able to influence more and uh, expand its footprint in few targeted regions in Europe, mm -hmm. especially in Central and Eastern European. So when, when China's footprint increases, we naturally see that there is an increasing disunity among the European Union members. For example, back in 2017, I think 2017 or 18, when European Union expressed that there, I there is an inherent uh, um, uh, human rights violations in China, uh, specifically to Tibet and Xinjiang. Uh, one of the members of the European Union went against that uh, motion. 
So you see that there is a, a differences of the opinion and China took that as an advantage. While we see that uh, European Union's chief has also concluded that an increase in Chinese footprints had in, uh, increased the differences. So there is a growing concern in the EU regarding um, safeguarding, how to safeguard uh, EU's unity and uh, stability as well as how to check uh, China's uh, growing influence. And we also see that some of the observers and scholars went to an extreme and calling China involving in divide and rule policy, applying divide and rule policy in EU, Europe as well. Mm -hmm. So we see the similar kind of uh, behavior being practiced uh, uh, when, we, when we are talking about uh, China-US relations, for instance. China-US relations, for instance, after the COVID-19 has also exposed fundamental differences between the two countries and it poses a challenge for both the countries to maintain a sort of a uh, balanced relationship right now. Many Chinese observers also, f they believe that a US-China relations, for instance, and a US will uh, impose, um, uh, what do you say, greater pressure uh, uh, on China in terms of um, trade ties, in terms of um, um, uh, technology, technological competition and uh, uh, cyber security and issues related to Hong Kong, Tibet and Xinjiang, we have already seen that. So in that sense, uh, there is a growing uh, idea that China and US relation has reached the lowest and it has entered the new Cold War, um, Cold War era. In a sense, what we can get from uh, these trajectory is that uh, 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 China's relation with uh, EU, for instance, or China's relation with uh, US or Australia or India, uh, for that matter, after the COVID-19 has changed drastically. And, and it is interesting to see in future that how will this change in the relationship, in effect, change the global uh, power dynamic? Uh, so, Wang Tala, again coming back to your surveillance upgrade system, uh, you have mentioned in your article that the private sectors and the companies, they have been facilitating the government can you tell us about that? One thing before we start on this topic, it's, it's important to know that uh, many of us have this conception that uh, everything in China is controlled by the state. It's state-run politics, state-run economy, and so on and so forth. So while this may have been true during the Mao's era, where everything was obviously state-run, there wasn't much of a private mm -hmm. sector, particularly in the economy right, and technology. But then you look a post Deng Xiaoping, you opening up period, Chiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and Xi Jinping. The private sector has come up, particularly when it comes to earlier economy and technology. Mm -hmm. So the private sector has been very influential, very mm -hmm. active in opening up China's market. So now, yes, so the private companies have a huge stake in mm -hmm. a lot of what China does, the government does, and, and the country does in general. There has been what I call a nexus between the private and the state when it comes to surveillance, right? Both, uh, either it can be state mandated, the state tells them what to do, or it's because of profit. Right, so for example, in 2012, the state mandated that the social media users in China have to submit the real names uh, uh, to internet providers. So normally when we make accounts on Facebook, then we use the real name, you have our own own, own other nickname. But in China, you can't do that. You have to give it a real name, for example. Uh, 2016, cyber security law was a huge law that was passed by the by CCP. And one of the fundamental aspects of that law was that the internet companies in China, they have to facilitate with what they call, uh, quote unquote, state control and data access by increasing surveillance of their own networks. So they would increase their own networks. They would censor particular stuff which you cannot read in, or see in China, for example. And more importantly, they would provide access to the government to the data data of the users. For example, on Facebook, if I uh, put up my date of birth, my, uh, my name, and so on and so forth, I can, I can make it private, quote unquote, and to some degree. In China, you can't do that, because state has access to that particular data. In 2017, you had what was called the World Internet Congress in China, right? Which, which invited all these global tech giants, such as Google, Facebook, Apple. And the same year, in 2017, then, Apple banned uh, 600 VPN uh, apps in, from its app store in China. And we all know how important VPNs are, particularly when it comes to Tibet and East Turkestan, mm -hmm. right? So because of how we get access to information there, right? Yeah. Uh, 2016, for example, because we know uh, Facebook and Google is banned currently in China, right? So in 2016, th there was a New York Times article which came out which said that how Facebook right now currently mm -hmm. developing a software. Like, for example, if uh, on our Facebook feed, on our Facebook profile page, I would go online, I can see a lot of stuff. Like I'll see issues of politics, culture, what I want to see, right? Mm -hmm. In China, you, if this app goes through, if they launch Facebook with this software, 
update. You can't do all that. It's again similarly, it's government mandated. What, what you can see. Similarly, we had this project Dragonfly of Google, which was going to be basically a, a, a replica of how what is Baidu works in China, which which is thankfully uh, shelved because of protests, right? Mm -hmm. So again, so you see now, uh, even outside of China, there is a lot of government and private uh, company interaction because of profit. As earlier, China is one of the world's largest internet users, uh, e-commerce market. So you, you so companies access that economy, right? That's important. And now, even now, you look at during the Corona period, this particular one year now, right? There have been a lot of upgrades to China's uh, to, to surveillance system. And then the reason they have given is that we need to control the pandemic. We need to we need to stop the virus from spreading. And uh, and for that particular purpose, for example, you've had uh, companies of Chinese companies like Sense Time, which is the AI firm. Uh, you have Megi, also AI firm, which basically are deploying technologies in Chinese cities and also in Tibet, in Xinjiang, and East Pakistan, and other places where. Even if you're wearing a mask, uh, they can check your temperature, they can see who you are through your mask. And then, then they relay that data to the government authorities. Biggest example of this nexus is Alipay Health Code, mm -hmm. which uh, is uh, a kind of a, a technology that has been brought up by Alibaba, the company, and uh, China's Chinese state, where uh, the company will basically access data, will check who you are, <coughs> your temperature, your, your, your health conditions, and, and it will give you a code health code and only if you have a green health code so you're, you're, you're free of diseases then you can travel outside the community and then that health code is given to the uh, p local police authorities so your your movement is effectively curtailed and now for example there's something called a ranking digital website the company which are ranked you know the major companies in the world in terms of how free they are from government control. So this group has ranked Baidu and Tencent, which are two of China's largest internet companies, mm -hmm. lowest ranking in terms of both uh, production of privacy, uh, in both freedom of expression, and in terms of both free from government control. Mm -hmm. So you see the government is increasingly there with the, government, with, with the private sector to control people's movements. And now, now the problem here lies in the fact that what happens after corona? When the corona uh, disappears, hopefully, that is, we're mm -hmm. saying, hopefully. But if it disappears, then will even these surveillance network disappear? It won't. Because mm -hmm. 2008, you had Beijing Olympics. And again, China said the same thing. We're going to increase surveillance to uh, assure our athletes, uh, our guests of, sec of security. Mm -hmm. The Olympics came, they went. The mm -hmm. surveillance network never stayed. So for them, Human Rights Watch has said the same argument, that these uh, surveillance networks are here to stay. Only the difference will be that they're intention purpose will change mm -hmm. from now controlling the pandemic is going to be controlling the people how does it aff affect the people in tibet in Turkestan, which are already under so much surveillance control, government control what well, human rights watch has ranked tibet second lowest in terms of freedom for, for, for the fifth year running tibet ranks quote unquote higher than north korea so mm -hmm. north korea technically is more free than tibet so, so that gives you an idea of what the scope of the surveillance is and what china's end game again as earlier is in these areas so I think that's the role that private companies are now playing in a very active role in the state's mission to control, predict, and, and what it is to modify people's behavior and movements. Thank you so much, Wang Dala and uh, La Tunla, for coming and speaking to us on Tibet TV. I think this book is um, very informative, and it just not concerns about the surveillance and about the you know, China's relations with EU, but also about other matters as well. It also has CTA's initiatives mm -hmm on COVID-19. So thank you so much for coming in our show. Thanks thank you. So much. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next episode of In Conversation with Tibet TV.